think that is what I wanted to say about preferencing. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, what can we do with, so you said that, as, that this order there's no effect on the polarization because the Euler <coughs> matrix is, is symmetric. You said something like that. Polarization. Yeah. So, I, okay. so what I said about polarization is that you have at this order, we don't see a rotation of images with respect to the polarization given by the Zeiss internet spaces. Yeah. Yeah. So, is there anything we can do with cross correlating like, polarization signals? And All right. So, um, okay, well, so what can we do with len of the, about lensing of polarization? So this is a bit, a bit of a different story because when you are studying polarization, you are not really concerned about light beams. Just single light rays with polarized light is, is interesting. So this is not uh, cons well. This has nothing to do with this story. But still, there are things that are done in this way. So what the question is, polarization is something that is partially parallelly propagated, and of course, because we are we have an inhomogeneous universe with a geometry that is non-trivial, then we can get some patterns. This is what we do with the lensing of the CMB. Uh, lensing of the CMB, sorry, the polarization of the CMB, because we know that the, C, the CMB is polarized to some extent, and we can predict what are the patterns of polarization. So that you have famous E modes and B modes. Um, Lensing does affect the polarization patterns of, uh, of that you observe in the CMB. So mostly it is due to the fact that you, that lensing of the CMB does a remapping of the CMB. So a polarization light given to something polarized like this, instead of seeing in this direction, you see it in a slightly different direction. So that changes the patterns. But there is also in, uh, in full generality an effect of the rotation of polarization due to the inhomogeneity of matter. I don't know what is the amplitude of that. Uh, I'm not an expert about the lensing of the CMD, so I, uh, should, I should have a look at that. But yeah, uh, lensing has at least indirectly an effect on polarization patterns. <coughs> anyway, if you want to do polarization, the big problem is that you need polarized light in the first place. And of, we have in the universe some uh, sources that emit polarized light. We can think about quasars, for example. Uh, quasars, they do emit uh, light which is partially polarized. What can we do with that? People have used that, for example, with radio galaxies, I think, to evaluate intrinsic alignment. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, so um, I know that th this has been done at least a bit with, with radio galaxies. Emitting polarized light to study how, how much this thing contributes. Yeah. Um, all right. But it, all those studies were made assuming that there is no effect of lensing on polarization. Because they say, okay, we want to study intrinsic alignment, so we suppose that the alignment is given by the polarization of light, and then we assume that this polarization is conserved during light emission. The effect should not be too strong. Because polarization, as I said, is kind of parallel transport, so it, de it depends. So the effect would come from non trivial uh, um, connections, crystal coefficients that are not exactly the same as, as in Minkowski or in FLRW. But so, uh, crystal coefficients, they are first derivatives of the metric. And we know that it's um, at the level of perturbation, it's really more second derivatives that are important because they are related to density contrast. We don't have too much big uh, accelerations in, in the universe, and so we don't have too, too big gammas. So the effect should be much smaller than the one that we had in lensing. Okay, so now let's talk about strong lensing. I will be much shorter on that. Just to give some ideas. Um, the first thing that I would like to say about strong lensing is that the whole thing that I have talked about in lecture two, you can throw it away in strong lensing, which is a bit of a, of a problem. So, um, because in strong lensing, you cannot consider that you have infinitesimal light beams. Throw away. 
in infinitesimal beam approximation. So that's why I'm talking about it in the, in the second section, because yeah. Um, so Zax is dead. Yeah. I mean, focusing theorem is dead. There's been recently an attempt to apply the uh, uh, weak lensing inspired or infinitesimal likely inspired formalism for strong lensing, and you heard about it here, because it's Chris, Chris Clarkson who did that with the, his roulette formalism, in which he was going beyond the, um, the, the geodesic deviation equation for light beams, to try to go a bit further towards strong lensing. So why am I saying that is, so it's actually easy to see if you have in mind one of the most important uh, image of strong lensing, which is the Einstein ring. So, if you consider an Einstein ring, so which corresponds, so in here you would have a lens, and suppose that this lens is well aligned with the source so that you can have rays coming from any direction, being deflected, going above, going on the left, going on the right, and you can observe this kind of patterns. Right, an Einstein ring. So this is the image in this case. While the source could be, for example, this. Something like that. Just a quasar, for example, that gets this crazy image. So it's quite clear here that I cannot get the image just by multiplying the pattern of the source with the matrix that is the Jacobi matrix that I have given uh, before. This is not just a deflection that gives you a small shear and uh, there are much more, I mean, infin <laughs> infinitely more modes of shape of distortions that are involved in that. So when you want to study <coughs> These kinds of regimes of lensing, you have to go back to the single geodesics and do ray by ray. So that's a bit disappointing when you have worked so much to study the propagation of light beams, but uh, sometimes physics is not too kind to us. Right. So yeah, the idea is that uh, clearly. We do not have something like uh, image or it's actually in the constraint source. way to do it is to consider actually that around each image point I have a small, I can consider an infinitesimal light beam and consider the Jacobi matrix associated with these beams. So a way to avoid this problem could be to say, well, actually what I have is just a succession of small distortions like this and to consider Therefore, the Jacobi matrix associated with any direction. In principle, there is no problem with that. It's just that why to do so complicated when we can actually work directly with light rays. 
So then we could say, what's the criterion now? Well, in which conditions can I use the whole thing that I have used before, so the small line beams, and in which situation do I have to work directly at the level of my phrase? The criterion that distinguishes between the weak and strong benzene which moves. So for that, I will work with the example that you have probably seen already a few times, which is the Schwarzschild lens. So let's take the example So in this case, I have just single mass, it's going to be my lens. I consider a source at infinity, very far away. That means, so when I say at infinity, it means very far away. From, from the mass in particular at a distance which is much, much, much larger than its Schwarzschild radius. And also such that the angle between the, uh, the source and the direction of the lens is very small. So this would be S at infinity. And well, so light propagates, so the light ray gets deflected, it's getting deflected essentially close to the mass, so on the right broken line, just to remember that this happens essentially at that, uh, the minimal approach here, so that I have to be seen up here. So for that. Thing that the image is in this direction. The immense position of the source, I call it beta. Position of the image, I call it theta. From just, um, okay, so Schwarzschild, the metric is d squared or minus a of r pt squared plus t r squared plus t of r plus r squared t omega with a of r equal 1 minus Schwarzschild radius the r, Schwarzschild radius of the mass being just 2dm and from the well if you calculate null geodesics using this metric and that you calculate the deflection of a light ray coming from infinity and arriving to infinity, so you need to break over the whole thing. What you get is that the deflection here, deflection angle delta phi, is uh, 2RS over the peak being the impact parameter. And then with a bit of geometry, and that's going to be the size of four. So just knowing that, using some triangles and, uh, and simple geometry. You put okay. theta and delta phi, is that intentional? Sorry? Is, is it you what? theta and so delta phi. Theta, yeah, okay, so Delta phi is the net deflection. Oh, okay, it's just, I just wanted to check that is the notation. Right? Yeah, well, well, so what you can, yeah, that, yeah, well, I could have called that delta theta, or yeah, maybe, maybe, okay, let me call that delta. No, I don't, 
Yeah, just that it's not real detail. It's, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So from that, you can show the lens equation that relates the unlensed position of the source with the lens position of the image, which is eta equal eta minus. Um, oh, forgot something. It's to introduce some distances. This will be, so this is lens with mass m. So this is distance between source and lens. Distance between lens and observer and the towards one will be distance between source and observer. So this is, um, our 2RS um, D, so yeah, let me remember. <laughs> There is one of the keys here. Yeah. Oh, well, I can remember how. Alright, DRS. Yes. What would you say? What what is the notion of distance that we have here? When I wrote those capital D, if you had to guess, when I want to, if I want to compute that, which kind of distance would I have to put? Those D's are angular. Distances. And actually, in defined in a way which is not trivial at all. Um, so they are kind of, So we have three things, right? We have the observer, we have the lens, and we have the source, and. You know, when we define angular diameter distances, we have to specify where is the convergence of the beam, when we say it's between what and what, and converging where. And so the, the definition is here, you can, sh well, you can show it, that it corresponds to those rays like this. So, well, I mean those patterns, so it's, uh, When we say D S O, it's converging to the observer. When we say D, when we say D S L, it's converging to the lens. And when we say D uh, L O, it's also converging to the observer. Which is not trivial because we, from this pattern you could say, well, I guess that for the relation between D L S it would be converging at the source, right? There is no uh, intuitive reason why this would be this kind of pattern, but it's how it is. So there's a convergence points of the underlying DAs. Oh, the underlying beam, sorry, it doesn't mean anything in this sentence. Okay. So is it possible to derive these results from Sachs equation? Sorry? These results from Sachs equation? So, um, it's not possible to derive this lens equation from the Sachs equation. It's, it's not possible. So um, the there are some side products, like the size of line strand ring, that you could derived from the Zeiss equation. It's a bit of a miracle, but uh, it's, uh, it's not the way it is derived usually. Oh, for, what is it? for the distances, was it the, the, the question of can you calculate the distance using the whole formalism that we have developed with? Uh, this relation at one theta. No, no, this one you cannot derive with the Zeiss equation. So, 
plus series and plus the three. Yeah. It's because they concern just individual large rates, not infinitesimal like beams. Right? Okay, so. So there's X equations that tell you how two neighboring light rays behave within a beam. This is what is the trajectory of a given light ray with respect to the unmet point. So I can integrate. It's quite different. Because we have something like geodesic deviation distance. Mm -hmm. So I can integrate that to find. So you will integrate between what and what? We have. What's, what's your idea? How would you do it with these equations? We had a notion of something called geodesic distance. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can I integrate that one? You call it zeta, I think, geodesic distance. The distance between the and geodesic. Uh, yeah, separation vector, psi. Yeah. Yes. So can I integrate that to find? All right, so that's actually not a bad idea. You could, uh, but again, think that. Um, for example, this thing beta here is completely absent from the from the sorry from uh, the the Zach's equations. Right? There is no beta. There is no unlensed thing in the in the geodesic deviation equation. You are looking at the behavior of two things that are all both deflected, not something not the difference between something which is deflected and something which is not deflected. So there is a bit of an issue here. But I see what you mean. You could say, well, I think I'm considering two neighboring thetas, and I know that, that they correspond to two different betas with a given difference, and I could do kind of integration like this. It's not impossible to get that, but you, you see already the problem that uh, somehow you have to know the answer when you start to do the calculation. I'm not sure that you can get uh, the whole, the, the directly the lens equation with the Zach's equations. Chris would say, well, if you go beyond the Geodesic deviation equation, you can do it. And I think it's, I think it's true, but uh, it's, it's not very direct. Yeah. If you consider two rays, however, then you can apply your idea. If you, you get two different light rays, even if they are separated by a non-infinitesimal angle, you could try to integrate between those two things, those X equations. Yeah. All right. Um, oh, I forgot to. I forgot the break. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so. Oh yes. Important thing. This prefactor here. Yeah? On the Einstein radius. So this represents the size, so this is the actual, the actual angular size of an Einstein ring. When we observe it. So, but this is anticipating a bit, of course, because for the moment we have just one ray, we don't know exactly what's going on. But we see here that in general, this is an equation, this is a second order equation for theta, which has in general two solutions. For, so for one, um, one source here, there are actually two possibilities in general. The one that I have written here, but also the other one that I do that. Yeah. So there are two solutions in general.
but it's quite easy to see if I multiply by theta, by theta on both sides, I get theta squared minus theta theta minus theta squared equals zero. So I have two solutions, theta plus and minus, which are square root is always positive, so that I know that I always have two solutions. Okay. So what the observer sees is the following. Observable. No, it's not. Indeed. So usually it's only for B to concede. So if I measure, what I'm measuring is theta, mm -hmm. and then I can go back to beta. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's not measurable, but it is the quantity that I can define theoretically. Mm -hmm. So yeah, what the observer sees is something like that. So this is the lens. Um, this represents theta e. So if the source is here. Then, so what I have is, so this represents beta, right? So the two images are aligned on the axis, the common axis of the axis that relates the lens and the unlensed source. And you see that they are given by one half of beta plus or minus something. So that you can check that there is always one image, so the one with the plus, which is uh, well above beta, but also bigger than theta e. So let's uh, see uh, two, four. So so there is always one which is stay here above theta e, and the other one which has the same size here, and that ends up inside theta e. So always one outside the, the, the Einstein radius and always one inside the Einstein radius. So this is plus outside the Einstein radius. And this is theta minus. Two images. Right. And now it allows us, so this reasoning allows us to give uh, a few, well, already a criterion for what can be considered a strong lensing event or a weak lensing event. As we have discussed so previously when we were considering a small light beam, we were considering some local distortions of it. There were no some splitting of the beam so that one goes in one direction and the other goes in another direction. In other words, a given image, a given source was giving only one single image. 
But here we see that we could have yeah, two images in general for this, uh, for this situation. So this is one criterion that you can have between strong lensing and weak lensing, the, pres the presence or not of multiple images. But you, would, you can tell me, well, look, uh, I can see here that there, is, there are always two images. So sh should I take them into account all the time? The thing is, sometimes the, um, the lens is bigger than its Einstein radius. So you see, if you have a lens, which is not a point at the center here, but uh, that is a disk that is bigger than that, it will mask the second potential image. So if you have a lens that is that uh, big, this ray does not exist because it would have to enter the, the lens. So if you have an opaque object that is bigger than the Einstein radius, you have just one image. So that's the first criterion. Um, so, uh, yeah. <coughs> Trivial statement. For a given V, they you could tighten that very quickly, no? Say it again. For a given V, you could tighten that. You wouldn't have to fill the Einstein radius. You would have to be. You, you, you could multiply by a factor less than one. And as V gets bigger, that factor gets smaller. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So wow, well, it's an order of magnitude. So it's always true. Yeah, but this is all exactly. Yeah. yeah, if you have an object which is bigger than its Einstein radius, then you never have two images. Indeed. It depends on, on the quality of the alignment between the source and its and the, and the lens. Um, so, this means that the diameter of the source divided by the distance, uh, sorry, the diameter of the lens. Divided by the angular distance between the lens and the observer must be smaller, in this case, than um, theta, which is, remember, to RS minus So in other words, I multiply both equations by TOL and I guess and I get sorry that the diameter of the lens must be smaller than what we call R E, so it would be the physical uh, Einstein radius corresponding to this angular Einstein radius. This square root of 2 RS TLS DOL. The important thing is um, this ratio between this diameter of the lens and its Einstein radius is not just a property of the object itself, it's also a property of the relative positions between source, lens, object. The, the, the more in between the lens, the bigger its Einstein radius in particular. So lensing events are particularly strong when you have uh, when you have events at the at the middle. Okay. Right. So, but that's not, not enough because you can also have quite strong deflections of the remaining image 
strong, strong, sorry, strong distortions of the remaining image, even if the second one is not here. And this is also something that we want to prevent uh, if we want to be able to describe those things with the Zax formalism and to still be in the wavelengths in the phenomenon. So I'm still discussing this, this, this uh, uh, dichotomy between strong lensing and weak lensing here. Just to be clear about that. This is not enough as the remaining image. So I will just make a drawing about that to, to understand the last thing. Um, yes, so let's consider an extended an extended source. So yeah, consider an extended source, for example, one here, one here, one here. So closer and closer, more and more aligned with the source, with the lens. We can see what happens here. If we consider here the image of this point, we see that, so we have two images in general. They are again aligned, remember, with this point and the lens. So it gives you something like this and one here. So of course, you would need to make the complete calculation if you want to know exactly what is the uh, distance of it, something like that. So same here. So my two images here are something like this and something like this. Same story, same story here. Start to see some flexion. And when I'm completely or almost completely aligned, right. so this is really qualitative, but we see pretty much what is going on here. If you have an object, well, an alignment, which is not very strong between the, between the lens and the source, then uh, the image that you get, you can feel that it's going to be almost, you can al almost describe it with just a shear and an amplification, while when you are going closer and closer to the uh, well to to the alignment with the source, you get something which definitely cannot be described with just uh, an ellipticity mode, and you have to consider this whole flexion thing until you get even the full ring, right? So um, the 
the criteria that we can guess from that are, well, for um, almost weak lensing would be that uh, you want beta larger than beta a. at least that doesn't get on the order of theta e and also well you don't want a too big source So this is the, these are the cases where you could, in principle, apply the infinitesimal beam approximation. If you're not entering the Einstein ring, the Einstein radius, and if you have a source which is actually infinitesimal, something which not to be. So this is all quite uh, expected. Um, just to say one word about the applications. Um, yes, in, in terms of the solar so it's not too big. Is this relative to anything to do with relative the or to the Einstein radius? Really? Uh, no, sorry. Relative to the back parameter, as we can see here. We we see right that. Um, um, what is it again? Should be a combination of the Einstein radius and and beta. Right. We can see here that if we get something bigger, we've got this, uh, we've got this flexion. We can start to see the fact that we have a circular geometry that would create this flexion mode in here. Um, it cannot be just beta. Because beta is already going to be way bigger than theta. Well, because the, the, the distance between uh, the source and the images is also driven by theta. So it's a combination of those things. Uh, it would have been good if I, if I had made the calculation in telling you a criteria <laughs> that would have been better, uh, like an actual, with an actual uh, quantity. Uh, if you're interested, I will do it in, in, in writing an email that will tell you. Um, yeah. So, yeah. some applications that so maybe the yeah use the cosmology So in the, the way we can use strong lensing to constrain cosmological parameters, cosmology in general, is, is the following. So if you have a way to measure the mass of the lens, and that you measure the um, multiple images pattern that you have. So in the Schwarzschild lens, you have just two images in the kind, well, in this situation. But suppose that you have a more complicated distribution of mass. In general, you can have more than two images. You can have things that are much more complicated and that you need to compute in general. But the idea is that you can, as in this example, you can always relate the pattern of the multiple images with the mass of the lens. I say not the mass of the lens. The Einstein radii, the, these some quantities that are a combination between masses and distances. So, what you can measure is the image patterns. What you can infer from some other observations like the velocity dispersion that you would have in a cluster, for example, if the cluster is a lens, you can infer indirectly the mass distribution of the lens.
We can also measure something else, which is the redshift. of the lens and the image, the images. And now the theory gives a link between mass distribution and image patterns. which depends on the distances. So especially as those ratios, DLS, DOL, EOS. So if you measure that, if you measure that, then using this theory you can constrain those quantities. And if you know the redshift of the lens and of the, uh, and of the source, then it gives you an indirect constraint on the distance which, angular distance redshift relation in the universe that you are working on. So that's the, the old, almost only way you can use strong lensing in cosmology. But this is done like this. So through this kind of ratio of distances. about the thickness of the source? Does it have to be small and compared to its action radius? Or compared to the... The source? The, yeah, the, the lens. Of the lens. Oh, sorry. No. Yeah, yeah, the lens. Sorry. So when you have... Well, that's the thing. When you are using that, you are using strong lensing events. So you can... It's really cases in which you have objects that are inside the Irish China radius. The, 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 sorry, the lenses that are smaller than their own lens shine radius because you need multiple images. But it might, it might happen that sometimes, so again, I'm not an expert, but I've never done, uh, never studied data, for example, in strong lensing. But you have, uh, you would have multiple images, maybe some, ones, some, some of the images are too faint to be observed or are masked by something, but you can reconstruct the, uh, the pattern using the others, I suppose. But yeah, of course, to have a strong lensing event, you need at least your object to be small, to your lens to be smaller than its outside radius. Or maybe with the with the flexion in the arcs, you can also measure things. But I think it's much more precise when you have multiple systems. Yeah. And yeah, so uh, this allows one to constrain. A of Z relation in the universe. I didn't give it in my preliminaries about uh, the, the, the homogeneous universe, but by the way, in a homogeneous universe, what we have, well, all the formalism gives you the A of Z equal rather than one C. So this relation that you all know.
I should have said that from the beginning, but you know, from uh, the expression, so I gave you the Jacobi matrix, you take the determinant of the Jacobi matrix that gives you the angular distance, and if you convert the scale factor into the redshift and the chi coordinate as it's to its expression in terms of redshift, this is what you get. So this relation depends on the cosmological parameters. So if you have some constraints on D and Z independently, that allows you to constrain this relation and therefore the cosmological parameters. So this is the whole story. Another way to measure, to use strong lensing in cosmology, but I'm not going to give any detail about it, is time delays. Time delay between multiple images. You also have a rela direct relation between the um, so the gravitational field and the time delay between the between the images, and if you measure their positions. You can, yeah, you can predict what is going to be the time delay. It's going to depend also on a similar kind of ratio, and you can use that also to measure mostly the Hubble, uh, Hubble constant in the cosmological parameters. Uh, yeah. So, also relies on the uh, ratio of angular distance. And I have almost no time, but I'm going to say a few words about microlensing, which is during the five last minutes. Anyway, I gave a seminar about that, uh, I think, six months ago or something like this, on the way microlensing can be used to constrain uh, the nature of dark matter. But yeah, just a, in a few words, Microlensing. So what we mean by microlensing is just a strong lensing event in the where we cannot uh, resolve the multiple images. So micro lensing event or strong lensing. So with multiple images. Where is not enough to um, distinguish, to resolve the images. So roughly speaking, that corresponds to um, so resolution Minimum theta, minimal angular difference that we can measure is bigger typically than the Einstein radius because we have seen that the Einstein radius is the typical separation between the images. Um, this is typically what happens for stars in our galaxy. Typical domain of application. So 
So strong lensing, of lensing between stars. Stars in the Milky Way. So in this case, the, the, the Einstein radius of the stars can be bigger than the stars themselves, so they can produce strong lensing events, but uh, the, the resolution of our telescopes is not enough to, see, to, to distinguish between those images. So what do we see? If we don't see multiple images, what we see is an amplification of the image. So the fact that we have multiple images plus we have some magnification due to the convergence of light rays manifests into something that uh, makes the source brighter than it should be. Even if we cannot see the uh, several images, we see amplification. And typically, what happens is that. We have a star, say, in the center of our galaxy or in the large Magellanic cloud. So, for example, that's the center of the galaxy. And you have another star that goes through the line of sight. When they get aligned, you have a strong amplification of the star that you were, that you were seeing during a given amount of time, well, the, mo the time during which they keep roughly aligned. So what you see in this case is, so if this is the intensity observed, and this is time, Well, you see the background luminosity, and at some point, shoot, modification. So this is the condensed one. Yeah, the amplitude of the peak is uh, related to how well aligned the, uh, the lens and the source can be. The duration of this thing is related to the Einstein radius of the star. And to the speed. Indeed. How well aligned. Just to give um, a few orders of magnitude, or oh, well, yeah, um, just well.